So Jeeva, the C stuff is sort of behind us now. You know, we've, we've dealt with that nitty gritty low level stuff with the syntax and, and all that sort of stuff. And, and we're about to get into the sort of cool part of Objective-C, which I think as you phrased it, the objective part of Objective-C. But um, I guess even as we move into this, there's gonna be a, a bunch of principles that we need to understand as well um, about object-oriented development that we, we sort of need to cover a little bit up front as well. Right. Yeah, the, you know, C, which is the basis of Objective-C, is a procedural language. And um, when procedures, you know, those functions that we were talking about earlier, earlier that enabled us to sort of break out and compartmentalize things and, and um, have functionality that wasn't just inline, we could call it and name it and, um, and, and things like that, that was a huge revolution when it was invented. I mean, that was really great because it helped programmers to um, to write clearer code. And to be sure, I mean, there's lots of things have been written in C using functions, using procedural techniques, you know, um, kernels and operating system applications and all kinds of stuff. And so it's definitely, that's definitely powerful technologies, even just in C. But after a while in the computer industry, um, Developers started to learn as their as their programmer as their programs grew as their applications grew in size and complexity that just procedural languages were not really enough. You know, you wound up having these um, as your as your applications got more and more complex. Kind of a you know a big flaw with procedural languages is that the functions themselves don't have any way of sort of recording their state. You know, you can you can call a function and it can't necessarily remember any of its parameters. It's 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 very much you know you you execute that function function and then you move on. So if you wanted to do things, um, if you wanted to do several different things with one object, then you wind up having to pass that same object over and over and over again to all of these functions. So it's not really not really. A great programming environment. It winds up leading to very complex code. For example, you know, if we look at some of this code here, um, this first code block here, where we're doing this sum code. Let's say that you had an employee, for example, that you wanted to um, do several operations on, and you could, for example, you could have a variable for the employee's name. You could have a variable for his age. You could have his birth date, his employee, his employment date, his salary, and stuff like that. And first of all, I mean, you wind up having sort of each of these variables has this prefix on it of employee. You know, if you don't have that, like the salary down here, for example, you know, is that the employee's salary? Is it a base salary? What is it, right? So you don't have that kind of contextual information with this grouping of variables. Secondly, when you actually go to actually try to do anything with them, right, you wind up having these huge argument lists because you have to pass the employee name, the age, all of these different variables. Now, you could use a structure for this, you know, um, if you actually defined a structure like called employee or something, and you could group all of these variables in there, in which case you wind up at least cutting down on your argument list, on your, argu on your parameter list there. But one of the important design concepts that developers discovered is that you kind of want to have the operations that do things to your data close to your data. In other words, you know, if we did something like this, you could have methods that operated on these employees and they could be often in other modules and other compilation units. I might have my my little library of functions out here for employee operations and you might have yours over in, in your area. And because I don't see yours, you might have written, say, for example, a, a method to give a, a, a raise to an employee. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, you know, and I may need to write the same kind of method, and I might not know that yours is there because they're not, it's not right there with the, the uh, structure and so forth, right? You begin to end up with duplication in libraries and exactly, exactly. functionality all over the place. Yeah. It leads to a big mess. Yeah. So the idea was that um, we wanted to come up with some kind of technology that would enable us to essentially encapsulate data 
like this employee, for example. Um, and at the same time, uh, and, and also the methods that operate on that data as well. And so that's really where the concept of object-oriented programming came from. So talking about object-oriented programming, sometimes, you know, I, I think as much as, again, you know, some of the people who are watching this may already be experienced with object-oriented programming, I think we need to kind of just sort of give a, a 30,000 foot level view of exactly what that sort of means. What, what is an object? What is a class? How do they work? You know, what are some of these kind of complex terms like inheritance and polymorphism and things like that? Where, where do those come from? Mm. So, the first, so probably the easiest way to do that is to kind of um, to use a metaphor. Um, now, one thing I've always noticed with object-oriented programming discussions, object-oriented introductions, is they always start with these metaphors of like, you know, you've got your car and you've got, you know, headlights on the car and you can have something that turns on the headlights and all these other things. Um, that always confused me when I was, when I was starting out because I always kind of thought that, well, I need to like sort of model my real world objects in my code. You know, these metaphors tend to sort of make you think that way. But I really want to make the point that when we're talking about these metaphors, it's more about sort of abstracting programming logic. You don't necessarily have to model an employee per se. It could also be modeling, say, for example, um, an operation queue. You know, that's a that's a an abstract programming concept that you might be modeling versus something that's actually a real world mm -hmm. object. A lot of people, you know, tend to think when they're coming to objects in the first place, they kind of get this idea that you know objects are there to to provide metaphors. When in reality, we, you know, who are teaching these things use metaphors just because it's easier to explain. Yeah. So, the metaphor that I'm going to use is actually um, animals. Okay. Okay? It was the so, other one I was going to say that always comes up, so here yeah. we go. So, imagine, so if you can imagine um, that we wanted to model the behavior and attributes of an animal. Let's say a dog, for example, Okay. So we could say that a dog has these attributes. For example, it's got eye color, and it's got um, a height, and it's got weight, and it's got a fur color, right? And each of these attributes can be different uh, based on each dog. Um, additionally, a dog has behaviors. For example, it has to eat. Um, it has to. It can bark. It can clean itself. Although some dogs are less cleany than others, but. Um, uh, it can also, you know, do things like hunting, um, stuff like that, right? And so, you know, if we wanted to model this behavior and this data in code, then you might say, for example, that we can create this class um, called a dog. And it might have all of these attributes as things that can be set based on a particular um, well, to use the object programming terminology, an instance of a dog. So in other words, the, cl the class dog might be thought of sort of as the platonic ideal of a dog. So I have this dog and it's sort of, you know, when you think about a platonic ideal, it's sort of this abstract concept dog. It's not a specific dog, but it's, it's a template that gives you a, an idea to think about dogs in general. Uh, the way I always like to describe it is like I always see the class is like the, the plans, the blueprint of your house. Right. And, and when you build the house, you're creating an instance of that house. Right. Now you've got one set of plans and you may build right. 10 houses. So right. you have 10 instances of the house that your class right. describes. Exactly. Um, I kind of like to use the word template. It's, it's a template for stamping out these things. Same kind of thing, a blueprint, right? And um, Let's come to your dog factory and see how you create them. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I might have I might have a dog, an instance of a dog. Let's say you know, let's say his name was Otis, right? And you know that particular instance of a dog might have might be short. He might be fat because he's a basset hound. Um, he might have brown fur. He might have you know brown eyes, or he might have blue eyes if he's a if he's a, you know one of those Alaskan husky dogs. Um, so that's an individual instance of a dog, whereas my dog class is a template that I use to create that instance. Okay. 
Now, again, in object-oriented terminologies, you know, other words for those things, there's the instance. Another word for that is an object. That's the object that we're talking about when we're talking about object-oriented technologies. So you've got an object, an instance of a dog. Then you've got this class, which is the template that you use to create this dog. The class is where you define the behaviors for that particular dog, so for, or for, for that class of dogs, the, 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 the species dog. So you can say things like, for example, um, I'm going to write um, instructions for how that dog will hunt, and maybe part of that is to track things, right? Um, those, those instructions are actually written as part of the template, the class. Then the attributes that are specific, you know, the, the class, the template, has a list of all of the attributes for that animal. And those attributes can be configured, can be set to have different values depending on the individual instance of dog that you're creating. You can also have certain attributes that are, you know, generic to all dogs if you wanted to, or even have default values and so forth. But, you know, it's, it's important to kind of think about, you know, these attributes, they're, they're defined on the class, but there's something that you can set to kind of customize your dog. So, you know, kind of like the height and the weight and the, the fur color and things like that. So, um, for example, the template, the class will define that there will be an attribute of eye color. Right. But it'll be the instance that will define whether, in this case, it's blue, brown, green, red. Exactly. Whatever Exactly. Else. You know, so, you're, so again, you have this, this attribute. You're saying, I have an attribute of eye color, but the actual value of that attribute is set as part of the object. Now, um, there's, now, I talked about instructions. So, for example, the instructions to hunt, mm -hmm. right? Those instructions are what are called methods. So, um, the class has these methods that are defined on them. So, for example, in our dog example, we might have um, this hunt method. And so, you might call this hunt method to have your dog, your instance of dog, go hunt. Now, it's an important point there that when you actually make this method call, generally speaking, you make the method call on the object, dog. So my individual instance of dog, I'm going to say go hunt. Now there is also the possibility to have methods that are defined on the class itself, uh, because in Objective-C, the class is also a first class object. But that's kind of an advanced topic that we'll get into as we get to that. That's more let's, of a, let's look at of a code thing. Right now, yeah. But the important things in terms of object-oriented thinking is to think, I've got this class, it's a template, it creates my object of dog, the class defines the methods, it defines the attributes of the animal, then the values are specified for a given instance, and then I can call those methods from my object. And if we just compare that to where we were just with the C in the procedural language and functional language, where we would, we would have to have a, a hunt function to which we would say, okay, here's this sort of totally separate hunt function, and here is a dog I want you to go and do this thing on, or, or whatever else, and all those attributes. You know, that's actually a very different model to saying, okay, I have my dog, and now I'm going to tell it to hunt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. That, that's a, you know, it's a different way of thinking, it's a different way of looking at it, but it brings us back to that place we were talking about in an earlier session where actually we can see now there is a connection between the code that's running and the data that that code is operating on. Exactly. The, the whole idea is to, in, and, and, you know, if you're ever, like, in, a, uh, in, in an interview for a software development, you know, and you get the question, what is the definition of a class, or then, you know, or, or an object, it's something that encapsulates the data and the methods to operate on that data together. That's really the, the whole definition of an object. That's it right there. So by kind of encapsulating those things together and, you know, grouping those things together, um, that's, that's better designed than having this stuff all over the place, you know, because it's all close together. Now, another important concept to think about when you're talking about object-oriented programming is the idea that, um, so you have this dog, right? Now, a dog there's a, a dog can also be considered an animal. So, for example, um, you know, you might have um, 
you might have, say, for example, furry creatures. And that's, you know, a dog is a furry creature. And there's also things like a horse, which is a furry creature. And both of those sort of descend. They have certain behaviors that they share, right? And um, so object-oriented programming gives us the ability to express these kinds of ideas. The idea that a horse and a dog both have fur color. They both have eyes, and so therefore they both have eye color. Um, so this is basically called um, inheritance. So in the same way that you can have, for example, you've got you know dog and a horse that are furry creatures, and maybe they are you know subsets of the generic idea of a creature, you know something that lives and breathes and go out goes out and and um, um, or just something with, with eyes, for example. It goes out, what, to a bar and yeah, to exactly. a, a club. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so you can have these, these attributes that are shared among different classes. So, um, for example, uh, so in this particular diagram, right, we've got um, furry creatures, which is a, what's called a superclass to dogs and horses. And the idea is that you can define attributes on the furry cl furry creature class, like for example the fur color, that the dog and the horse classes will both inherit from that superclass. And so therefore, by defining it in one place, you don't have duplication in these other classes. You could, for example, I mean you could have a horse class that defines fur color and all these other things. And you can have a dog class that defines all of these things. But that would be duplication, and you don't want that. What you want is to have the information, if possible, represented in only one place. And that kind of, again, goes back to that idea of you don't want to have to think about multiple things. You want to define everything in one place and one place only, if you can. So looking at our diagram we have here, <clears throat> we could say, you know, we see that a dog can track and bark. Right. But because a dog is a furry creature, right, it's also can sleep, clean, exactly, vocalize. Yeah. But because a furry creature is a creature, yep. it has other attributes. So basically, we're saying that a dog is a furry creature, which is a creature, exactly. and therefore it has all of the attributes and methods and exactly. templates of all three of those things. But we only have to write that code once, right? And the and you could go even further. You could say, you know, you've got this creature there, and it's um, defining things like eye color and height and weight. And by virtue of the fact that furry creatures inherit from creature, it gets all of those attributes automatically. In fact, uh, you know, here's another slide demonstrating exactly that point. That when you look at sort of the extended dog class, that you have certain attributes that are inherited. For example, the eye color and the height and the weight. And certain things that are not inherited, um, for example, tracking and barking. You know what I mean? And the same thing goes for you can have attributes and properties that are inherited as well as those methods, too. So, you know, we were talking about barks and, and things like that. Now, Objective C, um, so Objective C provides us with language constructs that allow us to express all of these sorts of relationships in, um, in objects. And it gives us the ability to create kind of complex hierarchies like this. You know, we could extend this further down and we could say that there are subclasses of dog that are basset hounds and, you know, golden retrievers and so on and so forth that have specific things. And again, we're still all talking about the classes here, the templates. When we create an instance of this, we're creating instances of objects. Now, another aspect of this inheritance property is that um, when you create a class or when you create an object that is an instance of a class, for example, if I create my dog object, right, Otis, when I create Otis, I can say that he is a dog, but I can also say that he's a creature. And by virtue of that sort of transitory nature of the type of that object, um, I can write code that is coupled, instead of being coupled to dog specifically, I can write code that is coupled to creature. 
And therefore, I can do things, my code can be more flexible. So, if I, in other words, if I wrote my code specifically for dog, when in fact the thing that I want to, um, to do is manipulate its eat method, um, then all I could ever do is pass in dogs into that method, right? And that would be the end of it. Whereas if instead I actually use the creature class to write that code, because my dog is a creature, it has that same method, and I know that it has that same method, and so therefore I can pass not just dogs into that method, but I can also pass, say, scaly creatures or snakes, because they eat as well. So that property, that, that sort of transitory typing, is called polymorphism. And it's a very important concept for object-oriented programming in that it enables you to write code that is not tightly coupled to a specific type, but instead enables you to write code that is coupled to the more generic type of a class so that you can, have, you can pass all different kinds of things into it. Which creates for us a load of power. It does. Uh, because we can write very generic code. We don't have to worry about every different type of instance of creature we're going to get in the future. Right. Uh, we can do that. Um, so what you're saying to me is if there's a method that takes a parameter that needs to be a creature, if I've got an instance of dog because it is a creature, I can pass it into that method and exactly. it's not going to complain. Exactly. And that's a really powerful concept. And it's also one that Objective-C leverages really well um, because there's the capability in Objective-C not just to, uh, to do this with um, things that you inherit from, but you can also, there's other constructs we'll talk about later that, um, that enable you to sort of um, abstract behaviors of classes, protocols, and stuff like that, um, categories that, that you can use with your classes to, um, to do the same kind of thing. Okay, um, a question here, and if we're going to cover this later, obviously just say we're going to cover mm -hmm. it later. Um, but uh, I've got a method, and it takes a parameter of furry creature. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, now, the furry creature has a vocalize method against it. Right. Um, now, because of polymorphism, I could pass a, a dog or a horse to that method. Right. But last time I checked, a dog and a horse sound quite different when they vocalize. They do. Um, so does this mean we end up writing, have to, have to cover all the different types of things w within our vocalized method on our furry creatures, or does polymorphism get us a way around that? Well, polymorphism does get us. It's not so much polymorphism, but more just sort of um, inheritance. Yeah. So the idea that a dog can, when it inherits from a superclass, like a you know a furry creature or a creature, something that... that a furry creature, for example, that can vocalize, um, you can actually override the behavior of that vocalization and have it do something specific for dog. So in other words, the dog class itself can um, modify the vocalize behavior to do something unique to the dog class. Um, like bark. Like bark, for example. Um, it can even, you know, you can have, um, like we've got here, you know, we've got a bark method on our dog class. The vocalize, the abstract vocalize version on the furry creatures might just call the bark method on the dog. Uh, you know, or I should say the, the overridden vocalize method in the dog class might just call the bark method on the dog class right there. So we can override, we call, we call it override, we can change the functionality from our superclass in the specific classes yes. to be relevant. Yes. But, okay, am I right in saying then, but let's say we do pass our, our dog into the method that expects a furry creature, and then that method calls or operates on the vocalized method of the object it's been passed, which as far as it knows is only a furry creature. Right. But when it does that, it will make sure it runs the actual vocalized method from the dog, right? even though it doesn't know it's a dog at that point because it's only been passed to furry creature as far as it's concerned. Yes, it'll still, uh, it'll still call the version of vocalize in the dog class. In other words, even though it just sort of 
looks like a furry creature, it is still a dog. So that method down in the dog class is the one that will actually be called when you call that vocalized method. I mean, this stuff is actually, I mean, we, we've just spoken about it all in, in, in a lot of it in one go, and there's still more. But uh, it, it's worth just pausing and making sure that, you know, this is making sense, really, because uh, it, it's not actually that complicated, but it is a very different way of thinking to writing procedurally. So if you've only come from a procedural method language, uh, procedural language to this, you know, you're going to have to get your head around this sort of stuff. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is, this is really a fundamental technology um, that you really need to understand in order to really work with any object-oriented languages. Um, and the important concepts are really that there are classes that are templates, essentially, for creating objects or instances of individual classes, um, that those classes can inherit from other classes. And when they inherit from other classes, they inherit the behaviors and data from those other classes. And they can override those behavior, behaviors and data as they see fit to implement things that behavior and, and data that is specific to them. So again, going back to, you know, the, the dog can override vocalize to do something that is correct for it. Um, but at the same time, because of polymorphism, when you're working with one of these classes, you can use any of the classes that it inherits from as the type of class that you think it is for the purposes of writing decoupled code. And that's really, uh, those are really the important concepts that you have to understand when you're working with object-oriented programming. Okay, so we, we have the basic concepts of, of object-oriented programming, or OOP, mm -hmm. um, if you want to say that word. Um, so what are we going to do next to, to, to build on this? So like I said, Objective-C provides um, constructs in the language for describing all of these kinds of relationships that we just talked about. You know, everything that we just talked about are very abstract concepts. Next thing that we're going to really talk about is the concrete, how do I describe relations, relationships like this in Objective-C? Um, what are the language constructs and keywords that I have to use to actually turn something like this diagram into a real working program? So that's, that's going to be what's next. Okay, so if you feel you've got all this, Move on to the next section. If that all feels like a little bunch of blah, 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 then uh, go back to the start of this one, watch again, and hopefully it'll be less blah, blah, blah when you get to the end the second time.